able to connect shortly. Okay. All right, we welcome one of our most favorite people walking the earth, our <laughs> Carl Gruber. I know, go ahead, shake your head, shake your head. <laughs> but Hi, Carl. Hi, Linda. I would imagine. Hi, Linda. Hi. Linda. Hi. Linda. Yes. Hi. Um, probably we could just take a quick survey, which I will not, to say, what's your favorite hymn? And you'd have one that you'd be able to. And it's interesting how those hymns stay with you. And I, for myself, at times, I'm singing them at different times <laughs> and things are going on and whatever. And uh, I told the story about my uh, car, my driver ed teacher used to sing the of my God to me when I got in the car. <laughs> 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 well, only well. because I went forward rather than reverse and went into the garage door. So uh, with him in there. <laughs> but anyway, Carl's going to share with us uh, this rich, lush history of a hymn from a Polish Lutheran. And yes. help me with his name. Frank uh, Klevinsky. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Kosakowski here can relate to those names. <laughs> but we don't want to waste any more time. So we welcome you and thank you. Here with us, please. Okay. All right. So here we are. Okay. So let me tell the story as to how this all came together. And uh, here we go. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, black. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. I love that. I love the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that okay? Can you see it clearly? Yes. Yeah. For those who okay. So um, my title is Psalms and Potatoes, a coal miner and his hymnal. And uh, we have here, um, part of my family is, is Polish. So, and as I said, I heard, learned German, but I also learned Polish when I was a little kid and uh, had lessons, lessons from grandma and she would teach me. And then I had an opportunity and I attended summer school in um, Krakow at the Jagiellonian University. And I knew there was a Polish Lutheran church active in Poland. And so wherever I went, I then decided I would visit the, the Lutheran congregation and worship with various Lutheran congregations in the summer of 1983. I went to the University of Michigan and I wrote a dissertation on the eight German Polish Lutheran congregations here in the United States. And what I did at that, I went to several places where, and visited the congregations and interviewed members. Um, in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, I had several interviews, about four interviews, and I interviewed Frank uh, Klevinsky's daughter, Helen, and she had his hymnal. And she then presented me with his hymnal because she said, nobody in our family reads Polish any longer. Uh, this is very, very interesting for us. You may appreciate it and please, you know, here's his hymnal. So I held on to it for, for 30 years. And uh, so this is his hymnal. Um, it says there in, in Polish, it says, sing, sing to the Lord a song. And then you can see the back of the hymnal, this cover, this beautiful cover with all the artwork. There is a chalice. In Slovakia and Poland, um, Lutherans, instead of wearing a cross, often wear a chalice around their neck, a, a medallion with a chalice on it. Um, because we receive communion, both bread and wine. And so this was one way that they would articulate or symbolize that, that experience. So you have this, um, you have the chalice on the back of the hymnal. As I said, I held on to the, the, the hymnal for 30 years. And I, um, this summer, a former student said, Dr. Kruger, did you read the hymnal, a reading history? It's a new book. It's by Christopher Phillips. I found it exciting. Well, I love reading history. I've written about Mary Muhlenberg and her reading her devotional books. So I said, I ordered the book from Amazon, sat down and read it. And all of a sudden ideas began to percolate. 
And all of a sudden I wanted to take on this project of talking about Frank's hymnal and you'll see why. So this project, if I had done it 30 years ago would have been very, 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 very difficult. Um, I would have never been able to reach the level of understanding um, at that time in 1990s, when I, when the early 1990s, because um, a lot of information was buried. Uh, but thanks to di digitization in universities in Germany and in Poland, as well as Ancestry.com, I was able to bring together very quickly some very important things that added depth to this project. So here we are. So the part of the world where we're going to go and visit uh, for a while is in what is now Northern Poland. Um, this is the, what Germany looked like prior to the First World War. And the district there is called East Prussia. This is where my family uh, came from, East Prussia. And so this is Northern Poland, Northern Poland uh, today. And so this is the area where this story begins and particularly East Prussia and then right across the border in a region, in a region called Suwałki. And so this is where Frank comes from. He comes from Suwałki. And so we're gonna talk about this region in Northern Poland. For a brief moment, I just need to go back to 1228, uh, 1228 to explain how this all came about. In 1228, there was a, a religious, military, uh, religious military group or military religious order um, called the Teutonic Knights. And they left what is, was Lebanon because they could no longer maintain the position there and they landed in the Baltic region. They landed in the Baltic region. So what would today be known as Poland, uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and Estonia. These were regions that had, were still non-Christian. And so they came and they began to Christianize uh, the peoples in these territories um, on the Eastern shores of the Baltic Ocean. So East Prussia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, this was their domain. Um, this is one of their fortresses. It was restored after World War II in Poland, Mar Marburg or Marienburg. This is the type of fortresses that they would build to establish control over the area. And they went about evangelizing, evangelizing people. They were also somewhat military. Um, they were also very, um, they became the overlords of these territories. Um, after 1410, uh, Poland and Lithuania began waging very successful wars against the Teutonic Knights to stop them. And so by 1525, the order was very, was very small, had lost most of its holdings in, along the Baltic, and they were struggling. And so the, last, the Grand Master, the master of the Teutonic Knights, he's not the last, they still exist, the, and the Grand Master was elected in 1509, and his name, his, his name was Albrecht of Hohenzollern, and he becomes the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights, okay? He is the commander for this group of people. As I said, by, by the, after 1410, this group was losing the wars, its land, its territories, and so he tried to redeem it. It didn't work, and by 1520, he went back to northern Bavaria, where he came from. So all that was left of their domain along, along the eastern shores of the Baltic was this region right here, which, is, which was called, it's Ducho Prussia. It's these striped lines, this red, this pink and white. This was all that was left, that was all left of their domain. And he gave up because he couldn't see any way out. And so, as I said, he headed back to, to um, Northern Bavaria, Franconia, particularly Nuremberg. In Nuremberg, he heard a Lutheran preacher by the name of, of Andreas Oseander. And Oseander talked with Albrecht and said, why don't you go talk to somebody? They may, this person may have some advice for you. And that person was Martin Luther. So Albrecht of Hohenzollern went and he spoke with um, Martin Luther and, you know, oh, I am the, the master, the, the commander of a religious military order. And Luther said, the gospel has nothing to do with the sword, forget it. So they started to talk about secularization of ending this, ending this order and secularizing the territory, taking those monks that were still in the order, giving them land, giving them a title and basically bringing it all to a conclusion. So Albrecht accepted the idea, but he needed permission. He needed permission from Poland. And so he goes to Krakow in May of 1525 with the idea of secularizing the land and the king, the king, uh, here he is, here's the king, 
His name is um, Sigismund the Old, Sigismund Stari. He gives his blessing to this project. And so here you have in Krakow this wonderful meeting in May of 1525, where Poland was giving permission to Albrecht to secularize the, the, the realm, to basically end the order, give these monks uh, secular titles and give them land, and they can be, be Lutheran. He had no problem with that uh, because it ended the role of the Teutonic Knights in the Baltic. So here you have Sigismund Stary, King of Poland, Albrecht of Hohenzollern, He's receiving the blessing, go make a realm, secularize it. Yes, you may be Lutheran. And so here's a 19, this is the 19th century. It's an artist by the name of Mateko. And he is the one who created this wonderful painting of what he imagined what this moment would have looked like in 1525. It took him three years, but he created it. It's a masterpiece. And this is one of those moments in history that we want to capture when Poland gives Albrecht the, the permission to go and create a Lutheran state. So here we are in July, 1525, religion from the top down. A decree is issued from Albrecht. Everybody who lives in this territory is a Lutheran. And that was how this proceeded. Now, this makes us very, very interesting. And it's, this map will explain why this becomes very interesting. This is the first territorial Lutheran church. It is multicultural. All of these regions that you see here in green, these were settled by Lithuanian, Lithuanian farmers whom the Knights had invited over. The region was sparsely populated. They invited Lithuanians to come settle. We will rent you land, come enjoy. These dark red districts, these were settled, these were settled by Polish farmers from Mazovia. They crossed the border, they were allowed to rent land, they were allowed, and so they made a success of it. And the blue areas are where Germans had settled. So this realm of East Prussia that is now a secularized Lutheran state has a population that speaks German, Polish, and Lithuanian. Aha, so now this has set something interesting into motion. So here we are, Duchal Prussia, Lutheran state, three different languages, since Lutheranism, um, added the vernacular to Latin, since Lutheranism wanted to worship and read in both Latin and the vernacular language, we now have to create, we now have to create resources in Lithuanian, German, and Polish. Königsberg is the capital, becomes the center, the center of this, this movement, this movement, this was the capital. All right, so here we are, this is the restored old cathedral. In, in Königsberg, it has been restored. And in 1544, they founded a university in Königsberg. We will have all of the traditional subjects, medicine, law, and theology. We will, be lecture, we will have lectures in Latin, but in theology, you lived in a dormitory. And there was a Lithuanian dorm dormitory, a German dormitory, and a Polish dormitory, so that you could improve your language so that you could then serve the church in the districts. So you would then be able to preach in German, preach in German and Polish, or preach in German and Lithuanian. So this is it. Uh, Melanchthon's uh, son-in-law, Sabinus, became the first rector of this university, the University of Königsberg. As we all know, Luther started translating materials into German. So in 50, here's a copy of the, the, a picture of the 1523 uh, German New Testament. 1529, we release a, a hymnal. There are eight hymns in this hymnal, and this is released so that people can sing. People can read the scriptures in German. People can sing in German, and this will supplement the Latin. So here we have that. But we now have to do the same thing in Polish for those districts where we now have Polish-speaking Lutherans. Catechism is translated in 1549 by a man named Jan Seklutian, and he also then started working on translating the New Testament into the New Testament into Polish. And so here we have, we have, uh, we have a catechism in Polish. We have, we are translating the Bible, the New Testament, and into Polish. And now we are going to begin producing hymnals in Polish. Here's a copy. This is one of these digitized, digitized um, hymnals that I had access to on my computer. It made this research more interesting and phenomenal. I'm grateful to Apollo University for digitizing this and making it available on the internet 24 seven, it's fantastic. 
Here is a hymnal in Polish that was published for this region in southern Poland called Silesia. There is still a separate Silesian Lutheran church in that region. Um, and it's it borders between Poland and, Czechos, um, and the Czech Republic. So here we have a hymnal, uh, literally translated, an excellent Polish hymnal, Kanciona. Uh, let me explain Kanciono. Kanciono is a, a word, uh, Kanciono is the word uh, for um, hymnal. It goes back to the Latin. A Kanciono was a, 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 Latin, a hymnal in Latin for the clergy or for nuns. So priests and nuns had canciona so that they could sing the various offices. And so they've taken that Latin term and they use it. Um, certain German hymnals were called canciona, but the term became very popular in, for hymnals in Polish. So we have an excellent, or as I translate doskonale, complete hymnal in Polish with songs, hymns, and psalms. So here we have this, and this was published in Southern, Southern Poland. In this hymnal, you have Luther's Catechism translated into Polish with prayers. Okay, so you have hymns, and then you have the catechism, you have prayers. Now here's a hymnal that was released in 1693 in Danzig or Gdańsk in, in Polish. And that's the city that's on the Baltic. And the hymnal was released there for the Polish speaking Lutherans in that territory. Here's the wonderful title page. You have David playing the harp, the Psalms. There you have the saints and there, and next, right next door to it, you have an engraved frontispiece, an illustration of Martin Luther. So your hymnal had and often had an engraving across on the opposite side of the title page, and it was called a frontispiece. And that was a wonderful, you usually put the author, or you might have put somebody important. And so here we put Martin Luther as an engraving right across the title page. Now I'm going to move forward to the 18th century. And I'm going to talk about King Friedrich Wilhelm I, because this is where it starts to become very important. He is king of king in Prussia from 1713 to 1740. The Hohenzollerns after 1613 have a problem. King Friedrich Wilhelm is a Calvinist. 4% of the population he administers and rules is Calvinist. 90% are Lutheran. Okay, so there is this this separation, the separation between Lutherans and Calvinists, okay? So this is important to hold on to. This is important to hold on to. The remaining portion of the population were Roman Catholic or Jewish. But here, 90% of the population were Lutheran, and the Lutheran clergy did not appreciate having a Calvinist king. So this becomes an issue. But Friedrich Wilhelm has something that he can use and that will help him, and that is pietism. Pietism is a movement that comes later in the Reformation. It begins in the Lutheran Church, and this was the idea of taking religion and making it personal, having it come and become a part of you, you working, in other words, reading your Bible, praying, attending worship services, and participating in a Bible study. This was pietism. It was to take religion, our Lutheranism, into a deeper format and make it more personal. So pietism is very important here. Because pietism doesn't matter if you're a Calvinist or a Lutheran. It, what matters is, you know, your faith in Christ, this, this, this faith of the heart. And so this is what unites, this is what brings you together. And so you can, you can as Calvinists and Lutherans, can sit in the same room, pray together, sing together, worship together. Because what it meant is we were, we were all on the same personal wavelength. Okay? And this has a huge impact on us because this is Hala. This is where Henry Melchior Muhlenberg spent a year. He was, piet he was a pietist, and he spent a year here at this Halle Foundation, which was built with money from the crown. The Hohenzollerns fun funneled money to Franke so he could build this orphanage, pharmacy, printing press, school, university, all of this there in Halle on the borders, on the borders of Prussia, so that this would, would actually improve the movement, okay? This would make the movement more, more st strengthen the movement. And Muhlenberg spent a year there learning before he accepted his call. So pietism has this agenda. And so Friedrich Wilhelm wanted a hymnal to be printed, to be printed for his population, Calvinist and Lutheran. He wanted a hymnal that would be acceptable to both. So here it is. A man by the name of Georg Friedrich Rogal, 
released a hymnal in 1737. He is a pietist. He is appointed by the monarch to be a professor at the University of Königsberg. So you see the connection between crown, you know, throne and altar. It's all brought together here. And so Rogal is a very important person and he is commissioned with preparing a hymnal that would be pietistic. It would not lean towards Calvinism or Lutheranism. It was going to be a hymnal that all both groups could use. And here it is. This is the, this is the hymnal. And this was thanks to the University of Göttingen. I could download this. I saw a copy of this in the 1990s at the New York public, but I didn't have very much time to spend with it. Nope, nope. Now it's I'll digitized. Tell you, Sam, I'll tell you what's going on. I'll tell you how their phone operates. She says, I have no idea. I'm like, holy shit. Well, they don't. Oh. And, I, and I'm the one that gave me the phone. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Oh, God. Absolutely ridiculous. And then, and then Sandy's apple, she's different. They said, no, you can't, Sandy. I can't help you. You got to go to apple. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, guy. I just can't. It's just all bullshit. That's what I'm saying. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Oh, it's it. absolutely terrible. Yeah. Oh, and then nothing funny. works, you know? One minute it does, the next minute it doesn't. Oh, no, I understand that. Okay, so. So, yeah, no, so you need some help with your new $1,000 thing? All right. All right, so here, what happens now, we have a hymnal in 1737 that is German, and then the, the order goes out, you are to translate this into Polish for the Polish-speaking Lutherans in the districts in East Prussia. And so a, a, a pastor by the name of Bazianski uh, Jerzy Vazianski, which translates George Vazianski. There we have this wonderful edition of a Polish hymnal. And this will be expanded and reprinted until 1926. Yes. All right. So here we have this hymnal. Here we have this hymnal in Polish that has a pietistic agenda. And so what, what, let's look at this hymnal because this is, the, what, um, this, were, this is what Frank Klevinsky will have. Catechism. Remember the hymnal in Silesia, the Polish Lutheran hymnal in Silesia had a Luther's small catechism. You're not going to find that there because this is going to be used for by both Calvinists and Lutherans. Okay, so this is the, the agenda. Right across from the title page, will there be an engraving of Luther? No. Okay, so it's going to be a hymnal that follows the template of, of Rogal and Vazianski is faithful to this. This is one of the cultural hallmarks of Lutheranism in Northern Poland, which was then Prussia, East Prussia, is that Polish was always printed with a fractor type. In other parts of Poland, you will always use a Latin type. So this became a very important hallmark in, in, Northern, in Polish Lutheranism in Northern, what is now Northern Poland. The literature was always printed with a fractor type. Bibles, hymnals, prayer books, Catechism always printed with a fractor type. So now, another thing of cultural hallmark of Polish, of Polish Christianity that is in Catholicism and transfers into Lutheranism is an entire section of Psalms of David. And here, the entire, in other, it wasn't just a verse from the Psalm, the entire Psalm had been, had been translated, I call them poetic paraphrases, and then put to music and included in the hymnal. And in this particular hymnal, the Polish Prussian hymnal, there are 50 entire Psalms that were translated in their entirety, that were translated in their entirety and are included in this hymnal. So it became a tradition for us to sing an entire Psalm in musically, okay, these hymns. So this is important to, to note that this is a characteristic. Rogal only had one Psalm that had been translated in its entirety for his hymnal. That was Psalm number nine. But in the Polish tradition, it was, we will also introduce some of our hymns, things that come from our traditions into this hymnal. And the people who led this were Mikołaj Rey, he is a Polish Calvinist author, and um, Jan Kochanowski. He translates all of the Psalms into, all of the Psalms into, all of the Psalms into, um, into Polish. And so 50 of these are brought into this hymnal. So here we are, here we are. These are the Polish speaking uh, Lutherans or Protestants, where I have the little X out. Those are the Polish, that's Roman Catholic. But these dark red districts right here, these are Polish Lutherans, Polish speaking Protestants. And in the 1700s, they will emigrate and cross the border into Suwałki, 
where there was less expensive land and they could begin anew. And so Klevinsky's, Klevinsky's family will move from East Prussia into Suwalki and that's where they will settle. Okay, so Suwalki, there's the Lutheran church in Suwalki. It's a town, there's a Lutheran church and the population, the, the congregation is alive and well. And this is the church where Frank and his brothers and sisters, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, they would have worshiped in the, in the Lutheran church in Suwalki. So Frank is born in 1880. As you see here, he will pass away. He's just turned 86 uh, in 1966. So here we have Frank. And in 1907, he makes the decision to emigrate. He's going to come to the United States. All right, so he is going to leave. He's going to emigrate from Suwałki, which is Northern Poland, and he's going to, to the United States. All right, the first part of this trip will go from Suwałki to Antwerp, Belgium. It will be by rail. He buys a ticket from the Red Star steamship line, and this gives him passage on a railroad to Antwerp. It's fourth class. Not first, not second, not third, but fourth class. All there were were benches, there was a toilet, there were no wash facilities, and so you sat in this car. When they crossed into the, into the German, German, when they crossed the German border, they had to show their ticket, which meant they were on their way to Antwerp, to the United States. They were not interested in settling in Germany. So the cars were blocked up. They then went to Antwerp. When he gets out of Antwerp, he will walk with all of his friends to the Red Star steamship office in Antwerp. And they will then look for the next available ship sailing to New York and they will book his, 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 um, his voyage. So Antwerp to New York is by ship. And here's the ship, Samlan. This is what it looked like in 19, this is in 1907. It had room for 300, 3,000 immigrants. They would be housed in dormitories below deck. Many would become seasick. It was not a pleasant situation. This was not a fun cruise. This was, this was difficult, okay? And you were on this usually for about 10 to 15 days. So he crosses, he crosses, he lands in New York, he goes through Ellis Island, and he heads to Scranton, Pennsylvania, because that's where his brother is. And so he comes to Scranton, Pennsylvania. So New York to Scranton by rail, the Lackawanna Railroad. So when he left Ellis Island, he would have made his way to the ferry that took him to the Lackawanna train station on the other side of the harbor, and he would have boarded a train for Scranton, Pennsylvania. All right, on the ship manifest, thanks to Ancestry.com, I know a lot about Frank. He never attended school, but he could read and he could write. He only had $5 in his pocket, and his wife would join him in 1908, okay? so. He joined a German Lutheran Polish congregation in 1909. Here it is, Emanuel German and Polish Lutheran Church in Scranton. Um, this, these eight churches that were German Polish belonged to the Missouri Synod. They were very successful in recruiting school teachers from Poland to, into the pastorate, and they knew both Polish and German. So here's this congregation that Frank joined in 1909. What did he do for a profession? He was a coal miner. This is the Lackawanna Coal Mine Museum. You can visit it. These are the mines in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's now a museum. You can take a tour post COVID. This is what he, where he worked from 19, 1907 until 1935. He was a coal miner. So let's take a look at the German Polish Lutheran congregations in the United States. Up here in the upper left hand corner, you have Sauk Rapid, Rapids and Pupple Creek. There are two of them. Uh, two congregations there, uh, right across from St. Cloud in Benton County, Minnesota. You have a congregation in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You have a congregation in Detroit. You have a congregation in Trenton, New Jersey. You have a congregation in Dundalk, Maryland. Congregation in Westfield, Massachusetts. And then you have a congregation in Chicago. These are the eight, three, six, seven, eight congregations, <coughs> excuse me, that were, had services in German and Polish. So here are these eight congregations. Everybody had family. And when you read the family in Ancestry and you see that people moved from Scranton, they went to Detroit or they went to Westfield or they went to Dundalk, that's because that's where their relatives were living. There was communication within this community, communication within this community. 
And so they were all, they would learn there's more, there's a better job opportunity here. They're paying 15 cents an hour as opposed to a dime. And so I had the privilege of interviewing viewing people in Minnesota, in Chicago, Detroit, and Scranton. And so this is how I built the dissertation of tracking this, this culture, this, this, this experience of the German Polish Lutheran congregations in the United States. Thanks to the census, I can tell you a bit about Frank's life. He was married to Catherine. They were both 38 years old in the 20, 1920. They had four daughters. Their only son at that point had died in 1916 when he was one year old. Frank could read and write, spoke English, rented a home on Atlanta Avenue, worked as a laborer in a coal mine and was paid for the days he worked as opposed to receiving a salary. So he's a coal miner and he's paid for the days he works. You don't work, you don't get paid. So that's life in the 1927, 1920, 1920 census. census. The 1930 census, I, in addition to Frank working in the coal mines, two of his daughters, Helen and Annie, are working. Helen is a winder in a silk mill. Okay, wherever you have coal mining, you usually have silk mills because the coal was needed to run the machinery. She's working in the silk mill. Annie is a servant in a, with, working in the home of a private family. Frank and his wife were now American citizens. They rented their home for $30 a month. They will never own a home. They will always rent. Helen and Annie, along with their younger sister, Alma, never attended school, just like dad, but they knew how to read and write. Dad took care of that. The two youngest children, however, they wanted to make it to improve their life. They were going to get to school. So Julia and Edward, who is now nine, are in school. The 1930 census asked the question, does your family own a radio? And, were in that. and the answer for the Klebinskis was no. So here we are. So Frank brought his hymnal with him when he emigrated in 1907. This was given to him either as a gift when he was leaving or when he married in 1907. This was his hymnal. And so I just wanna, the title page is, is giving you all of the benefits of this book. It's an enticement for you to buy it. So they're gonna tell you everything you're gonna find between the covers of this book. This is the Prussian hymnal. This has a selection of hymns that were sung in the realms of Prussia and Brandenburg with verses of Holy Scripture over each hymn with ardent, ardent, fervent prayers, ecclesiastical, common and specific, helpful to all. And there are there's indexes, there's indexes here and there's a teaching preface that will show you how this hymnal can build you up. And this was printed with the royal privilege of Prussia. There was only one printing firm that was allowed to publish this hymn, hymnal and that was the Hartung family. So here we are. Look what Frank did with his hymnal. Right across the title page, where in others you might find a frontispiece, an engraving of Martin Luther, it's blank. We have nothing. Frank uses it to put down his favorite hymns. He starts creating a register. So here's the title page with the register. Okay, so let's turn the page. Oh, well, let's look at the back of the book. Here are the free end papers to the back of the book, and here are more hymns. Okay, so all in, all in all, there were 50 hymns that he either listed or he put an X next to because they were important to him. He begins his register at the back of the book because that's where indexes were found. So the back, the index is at the back of the book. So he begins right there at the back of the book, back of the book to start listing hymns that, he, that speak to him. The one in the front is at the end of his life. I support this by saying this is very, his writing is very stable here, but you see here his spacing in his writing is no longer as steady. And so he's, become, he's getting older. So here we have hymns that has spoken to him. All right, you turn the pay, title page, what do you see? You hear, you see a Bible verse from um, Sirach, the book, one of the apocryphal books that talks about David singing hymns. And so that is the lead in. Right next door in German is the royal privilege. The king that gives you all the titles of King Frederick Wilhelm back in the 17, 1730s and 40s. And he signs his name here. And he is saying very clearly, only the Hartung family publishing house may publish this hymnal. It was left in German here because it was talked to any, it would talk to a German enterprising printer who thought, I can print this. No, you can't. Then here, there's the royal privilege. And here you find a teaching preface. The author gives 10 recommendations on how to work with hymns. Frank listened to it, Frank read it, and Frank understood it. So what is the teaching preface basically saying? Be patient, not all hymns will speak to you. We can identify with that. We have our faves and we have the hymns that we, uh, you know, so not all hymns will speak to you. Some hymns may actually will disagree with you, particularly in public worship. 
if the pastor didn't realize you didn't like that hymn or the organist picked the hymn you didn't like, it's like, well, just sing it. You will come up with hymns that you might not like. Thank God for the servants who wrote the hymns. And then says, if you don't like the hymn, then as Luther says, go to another tree. So Luther is quoted here. This is the one place where Luther got quoted. There's no picture of him. There's no catechism, but he did get quoted. And as Luther would say, if you don't like it, go to another tree and pick the berries from that tree and see what happens. And God will speak and you will be blessed, period. So let's see. All right. So here we go at the back of the book. We're at the back of the book. Here is the index. This is in German. It was in Polish and German. Then here is, here is the prayer book. So here are the prayers, prayers for worship in public and at home. Now, this is key. See that arrow? That arrow that goes right across and it's directing your attention to the lower right-hand corner of the page of the book. If you look there closely, there's some discoloration. What does that say? This is where his, this is the oil and dirt from Frank's fingers are on this book. He came to this and read it frequently. That's a mark. That is a sign this, this person, this owner, Frank, read it. All right. So then how, how is he led to the hymns? How is he led to some of the hymns that he, he selected? So here we are. This is morning prayer for Monday. It's right here. Here's morning prayer for Monday. Well, what they would do is, what they would do is when you finish your, here's the oil, here you are, the oil and dirt from Frank's fingers here on the Monday morning prayer. He was reading this. When you begin your week, it says, open, begin with prayer and pray for God's blessing. And then what does Frank do? We, we conclude morning prayer up here for Monday. And right here, the editor has suggested two hymns that you could use that would take this prayer and make it more meaningful, that would enhance this prayer. And it's this hymn on page 376. So we turn up. Oh, there we go. There it is. Uh, there's the hymn on page 376. You know, oh, good and gracious God, oh, good and faithful God. Okay, so let's go. We're on page 376. And here's the hymn. There's the hymn. It's number 374 on 376. There's the German title so that the organist, if they're German, could still play, could find the hymn and play it. But here's, here's this hymn, this hymn that caught, oh, oh God, oh God, oh faithful God, my God, my faithful God. Oh God, and here it is, uh, it was translated into English by Catherine Winkworth, and it's a beautiful hymn. Okay, oh God, thou faithful God, thou fountain ever flowing, without whom nothing is, all perfect gifts bestowing, a pure and healthy frame, oh give me. You go in the second verse, and I underline one phrase, my call here fulfilling. Mim stanie in Polish, meine stand, meine stande. Is my, that, that is a, a term, stanie, uh, stande is a, ger, a term that means your station in life. But when we translate it from the religious lens, it means your calling. And Frank has heard this hymn calling him, a red morning prayer on Monday. This is the hymn selected. He comes here and he hears that he has a calling to prayer. So pray. So what does he do? If you look at where he begins his register, he's living at 109 Grand Street in Dixon City, which is the sub first suburb north of Scranton. What's the first hymn? 374. So he takes this prayer, he reads it, the dirt and the oil on that page says he's been here. Then he reads this, oh, here's a suggested hymn that will make this prayer more meaningful. He reads it, he sings this hymn, and it's the first hymn in his register. Beautiful. So here we are. Here are two hymns on this, fly, what we call a flyleaf, that are separate by themselves. And this one here, he has framed with his ballpoint pen in a frame to set it apart from everything else. All right, 716, Kyrie eleison. There we are, Kyrie eleison. So let's go to 6, 716. There it is. This is the hymn that he noted in his flyleaf where he framed it. This is an important hymn. Remember, he now understands he has a calling to prayer. All right, here it is, this beautiful long hymn, beautiful type, beautiful, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy upon me, zmiloi, zmiloi, zmiloi shon nadvami, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O God. We know this hymn, it's in our ELW, it's called the Great Litany on 238. Frank, 
finds this hymn speaking to him in his calling to be a person of prayer, and he is praying for everything. This hymn, this hymn goes through every facet of life, and you're praying for it. Save us, good God. Help us, good God. Spare us, good Lord. And this is what he's doing. He's praying for himself, for his friends, his family, his church, and the world. This is a part, and he, he frames this hymn with a little frame around it, a little frame around it, and he loves it. All right. So let's, he's wrapping it up. His handwriting is a little scratchy, and he's putting hymns in, in, a, in a vertical as opposed to the horizontal because he's running out of room. So this is one of the final hymns he notes, 534, uh, Bogu Janki. All right, what's he talking about here? There's hymn number 534. You know hymn 534. We all know it by heart. Now thank we all our God. So as he's coming to the conclusion in his personal registry of hymn favorites, this one speaks out to him. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things has done and whom his world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and is still ours today. This coal miner working in the mines for minimum wage, had renting a house, raising a family, living through all of this, this is what empowers him to live out his life. So what do I conclude here? I just wanted to do three hymns. He follows the recommendations in the teaching preface that was written in 1737 and the prayer book, speak to him in the 20th century. All right, out of a collection of 929 hymns, 50 are important to him, and he makes note of them. He puts them in his index, or he puts an X next to the number. 14 hymns came were the suggested hymns at the end of a prayer back in the prayer book section. So he was reading all of the prayers in this prayer book as he would sit there. His daughter, Helen, who gave me the hymnal said in the evening, her father would come home from work, he'd have dinner, and then he'd sit in his chair, he would read his Bible, and he would read his hymnal. These were the books that empowered him. And so eight of these hymns were full poetic paraphrases of an entire psalm. So here we have it, Frank, living out. So this hymnal is the story of a coal miner and his hymnal. It's a story of prayer and reading that empowered Frank to enter the mines, earn his daily bread, and with his wife, raise a family in a new homeland, in a foreign land. His hymnal and Frank's marginalia demonstrate that he embodied the Lutheran ethic. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. That's how Luther phrased our piety. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Oratio, pray. Meditatio, meditate. And under that is reading and contemplation. Tentatio. In medieval piety, when you prayed and you, you meditated, you removed yourself from daily life and you went into a cloister, you went into a monastery, you isolated yourself from daily life. Luther reversed the direction and said, go back to daily life. Go back. Go back to daily life. Get into the crucible of daily life and live out your faith. And that's what Frank did. He prayed, he read, he meditated, and then he went back to daily life. So Frank understood that the whole church is a priestly people and exercised his priestly call by praying for himself, his family, the church, and the world. He prayed, he meditated, he recorded his resources in his hymnal. He transplanted his pre-migration spirituality in Scranton, and it helped well, he died at the age of 86, 86 in 1966, but his legacy lives on in his hymnal. There's his obituary, and that's if there it is. His service would be at, at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. He lived out faithfully his life. And so, people of God, people of God, that's a story that inspired me. And I just wanted to share a little of the story and how this comes about. And I just was able to honor Helen's wish. 30 years later, she handed me that hymnal and said, you would appreciate this. You know, maybe it can help. It sat on a shelf for 30 years, and now it's alive and well, and I'm going to write this all up and publish it so that others can read the story of Frank Lubinsky and how, how, we, how we live out our piety every day in everyday life. So there you go. Bravo. Bravo. All right. Yay. Yay. <laughs> So yes. thank you for inviting me to your computer screens, to your, that was wonderful. To your computer screens in church and at home technology. It's our friend sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have questions, it's only, it's only 1154. If you would like to fire <laughs> up some questions, feel free. 
Uh, Cara, I just want to point out just to me how things come together. Today in church, we sang him 308. Uh, a morning star, how fair and bright. And we okay. were told, which I did not know, that this was written at the time of the uh, plague, I believe. Yeah. 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 And that how a hymn can reflect the presence of God within people and how we turn to those hymns time and time again to renew us, to restore us. And what struck me so much in your presentation was this. When I say simple person, I don't mean inadequate. Or I understand or, exactly what you, yes, I understand. I, it, you know, the, you know, not mm -hmm. having some of the blessings, for instance, that I have had in my life in terms of education, financial stability and such. And his source of strength is a source that we all share. Right. And, and as you said, 308 was unfamiliar, but you learned the story that it was written during the plague. And so this is how we turned in this, this moment this is how we turn in COVID. You know, this is, you know, I mean, COVID has made us all um, involuntary shut-ins at various points in our lives, you know, it, it, involuntary. And so, you know, what do we do? Well, what, what did Frank do? We pray, we meditate, and we get back into daily life. And we know we'll get through this. So, yeah. So, yeah. Him speak to us over the centuries. You know, about the uh, the tunes, of course, the, the words of the hymns were written down in the hymnal, but there are right. tunes. I really very, good, very good observation. Thank you, thank you. That is that is important. Um, that was the only person that had the music was the organist. They had a rather large book that they had up on the organ rack. They had the tunes. They had the music that they could play. So how it works is, is having lived in Germany and, and worshiped in congregations and served con Slovak and German congregations here in the United States, you all knew, you knew by heart the hymns that you would sing at Christmas and at Easter, okay? They were the ones that were favorites, you, you sang those. But there was a core group of 15 melodies that you knew, that you knew, that you knew um, by heart. And so you would sing that, you could sing that. And so what they would often do is use these very common, not, not common, familiar, there's the word I'm looking for, familiar 15 tunes time and time again, so that you could, they, they, the words changed, but the tunes stayed the same. So That's you're, you're why right. That, like, that cadence or those numbers are listed, right? After hymns yes. to, to say what tune it would fit to or something like yes. that. There was a, it was printed in German right across the top of it. If it was a, from, from the German hymnal, you know, the tune would translate. A, a tune can be used, the tune, you know, once you have a tune, you can put words in Latin, Greek, German, English, whatever, you know, use it again and again and again. And then um, if it was a, from a Polish source, they would just say another composition and they'd give you the name. So yeah, they give you the name and the organist knew which, where they had to turn the page. As was customary in Polish Lutheranism, um, the, you arrived an hour before church and you sang a cappella. Oh. And so the organist never had a chance really to play a prelude because everybody would sing a cappella, their favorite hymns. So these mm. tunes were entrenched in you from childhood on, and they would just call out a number and the congregation would sing. And the one hymn that he chose was noted in one of the German histories of the area that it was one of those hymns that would just, they raised the roof. I mean, you have 200 people sitting in a church a cappella, singing at the top of their lungs. There you go, you know, yeah, a good old fashioned hymn sing. And they would do it. They would sit there for an hour before church began singing. And their probably hymns. in four part harmony too. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they could, yes. <laughs> yep. You know, it strikes me, Carl, um, so often I go back to my love of anthropology and almost from the beginning of anything that's been recorded, even on the wall of a cave, you see that all peoples throughout the world, throughout history, have sung, have, mm -hmm. have had music as a mm -hmm. part of their very fiber. Right. And, you know, just, just thinking about the hymns, in my own heart, I put that in a very special place because there's certain hymns that I attach to certain events in my life. Yep. Whether at the funeral service of a loved one or, right. or as a little girl, you know, singing at the top of my lungs. You may realize how significant music is to us as sure. 
Yeah. And this is this is this is the Psalms. This is the Psalms in the Hebrew scriptures. They're songs. They're meant to be sung, you know, and, and they embed it. And when you take text and put music to it, it goes, it arouses, it 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 goes further into it, it gets further into us, you know. I mean, it it, it strikes our soul, you know, when you put word and music together, text and give it something, you know, it, it reaches us at levels, it reaches us at levels that mere reading, um, it transcends it, 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 that mere reading can achieve, you know, I mean, we all know Psalm 23 by heart, you know, we all know Psalm 23 by heart, that's one we know, and we recite it at funerals, because it's important to us. And then when it's sung, when we sing it, or hymn that's based on that, it speaks to us even, even, you know, even at a deeper level. It's a different part of our brain. Yes, there. And, yes. And right. some people who've had strokes can't speak, but they can sing. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, Alzheimer's too. Yeah. With Alzheimer's. Yeah. yeah. All people with Alzheimer's too. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And that is remarkable. Yeah. Just another gift from God, isn't it? <laughs> Which sometimes we just take so many of his gifts for granted. <laughs> but we're surrounded by so many of them. And you can see where the teaching preface was trying to remind that in these 10 short recommendations, you know, give him time. It may grow on you. It may not. If it doesn't grow on you, go to another tree, <laughs> Pick the fruit off another tree. you know, and, and God will bless you. Trust me. You know, and you can see Frank taking advantage of that, you know, doing that very thing. You know? And I think it's empowering for us in the 21st century to see, you know, our spiritual ancestors, you know, living, you know, coming to a new homeland you know, immigrants and then transplanting their pre-migration spirituality. And what was important was they, they were living hand to mouth and yet we're going to build a church. We're going to pay for a pastor. We're going to go to church because God is with us. And God came with us just as God went with the, you know, the Israelites from Egypt to Israel. God came with us. You know, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a new exodus. And they lived that faith out, you know, and it's just so heartwarming. When you think about how, you know, people came to this country, they didn't have, you know, suitcases galore. I mean, you know, whatever you packed had to be really precious to you. So just think about, you know, the one book he chose to bring, or at least. Right. And he brought that book and he had only $5 in his pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and then he, you know, and, and then he will take a job in the coal mines and live out his life, you know? Well, that's a real treasure that you have. Sure it is. Yeah. It is, and, and I was, you know, I was debating what am I gonna do with this book? And as I said, I read that book, uh, the hymnal, a reading history. I'm into reading history as a librarian. And all of a sudden ideas started to percolate. And I've been working with this project since October, pulling this together, doing the, 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 the putting it together. And I'm in the stage now writing this up so I can publish it. So, you know, so that it can be, it can, somebody else might see, have a hymnal in their house or somewhere else in a library and all of a sudden say, oh, I can apply the same techniques to this hymnal and allow it to tell me the story. Because of ancestry.com, I could, I could not gather all of that information about, about Frank. I've been looking for needles in haystacks for years. I'd have never found it. There, it's all, it came together in two days. I had, you know, the census, the, his ship manifest, his naturalization papers, all of this came together and it was like, I now know his story and I want to tell it because yeah. he's a hero. He's a hero of the faith. Well, it was to me a classic example of what we call my family it meant to be, but it's the Holy Spirit. Right. Yep. And exactly. Came about, you know, little by little and that explodes in glory. I, I, I love the, the, uh, the fact that you made note of the darker smudges on the pages. Yeah. And honestly, I am going to go home and look That's at some of the books that were where belong to people I love and just look for those spots on those pages. I think that's a treasure. Didn't Looking for the spots or any marks, any yeah. handwriting, but but the marks, the, the, the stains in the corners where you would turn the page, that comes from the fingers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Holding the book and then turning the page. Yeah, yeah. really a treasure. Thank you again for, for inviting me to your screens at church and at home. I'm so sorry the weather didn't work out. Um, but I will bring the hymnal with me on March 16th so that you can, you can see, can we see it. I, I, it's right here. Um, I will bring it with me so that you can see it and see this, this artifact of faith.
Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God's you. blessing. Thank you. God's blessing. I'll call you later today.